I'm happy to welcome you to the next Carla lunchtime presentation. Today we have Anna Anderson and um, Mandy Menke talking to us from the Spanish department about the development of academic writing skills in the academic major. And Anna, you're first, I believe. Oh. No? <laughs> sorry. <trust> you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sorry. All right, well, good afternoon and welcome and thank you for being here. We're really excited to share this project. We're excited to be able to share kind of the, the first round of findings and what we're seeing and some trends. And um, what we're sharing with you today is actually an adaptation of two upcoming presentations that we have, one of which is happening this weekend at the Georgetown University Roundtable on Linguistics. So we're going to be presenting and expanding a little bit upon the first half of the presentation this weekend and then next month at AAAL, we're going to expand upon the second half of the presentation. So we're really excited, like I said, to, to be able to share these results with you, engage in dialogue about them, and gather your feedback. So with that said, we'll go ahead and get started. The outline, maybe. I messed up. Sorry. That's all right. I'll try now. All right. <laughs> All right, so the outline for our talk. So I'm gonna give you a brief introduction to what academic writing is or an overview of it. And then we'll introduce the project, the WEC project um, from which the, the data are coming. And then Anna is going to talk a little bit about what faculty expectations are for writing in the major and then what we're starting to see as far as student performance in relationship to those expectations. And then from there, I'm gonna take one of the criteria that's, that faculty have identified, which is um, the ability to, uh, to take a critical and analytical stance in writing, and we're gonna start looking at how students do that. And so then we'll conclude with a discussion and some directions for future research. Okay, what's the trick? All right, now we're here. Okay, <laughs> so at its core, academic writing is about presenting and debating ideas. The presentation and debate of ideas does not mean just repeating what others have said, but rather using those ideas to develop others and construct new understandings or meanings. In this way, it's about creating new meanings to draw on Dutro and Morin, or new knowledge to follow Schleppigrill. Burns, Maxim, and Norris in their 2010 seminal work on developing advanced foreign language writing capacities referred to academic texts as knowledge transforming in contrast to knowledge telling texts. If we look then at common descriptions of what academic writing is, um, a word that comes out in a lot of these is complex, which indicates the multifaceted, complicated, interconnected nature of the topics dealt with, whether they be processes or concepts, or the thinking process used to arrive at the conclusions, such as those used in comprehension, problem solving, or expression. Diaz, Rico, and Weed in 2002 describe academic literacy skills as a cognitive toolbox. It's a set of, set of thinking skills and language abilities used to decode and encode complex concepts. So some of the common features of academic writing are identified here. At the top of the list, you'll see that I've um, included the high level of explicitness for distant audiences. And distant audiences, we mean both distant in time, right? They may not be present at the actual writing or at the sharing of the event, but it also can mean distant with respect to the content. The reader or the, the, the listener may not be as familiar with the content as the creator of the message. And so there's a need and a desire to minimize the possibility of misinterpretation. In order to do that, we have a high level of explicitness in academic writing. So we avoid the use of vague res reference, confusing pronouns, or isolated, di I can never say that word, deitics. <laughs> um, and then we also see a level of detachment of the author from the, me the message, and then an orth authoritative or knowledgeable author's stance. And so in order to do that, there tends to be logic presentation of logical reasons and evidence and those are emphasized over the feelings, opinions, and personal stories. 
In order to do all these things, a high level of sophistication with the language is required, not only with respect to technical lexicon that accompanies academic writing in a given discipline, but also idea development and construction, which requires the use of grammatical metaphor, nominalization, passive voice, information condensation, or con and more. So in 2002, Heidi Burns called for greater orientation to language meaning and use in foreign language studies departments. She wrote, if programs are to recognize the complexly staged long-term process of successive approximative interlanguage systems that learners follow, they need ways of envisioning what counts as success, both from the teachers and from the learner's perspective, without relying on the descriptive certainty that goes with accuracy. The Writing Enriched Curriculum Project, or WEC, is allowing the Department of Spanish and Portuguese Studies to do just that. The WEC project, which is housed in the Center for Writing, is an initiative of the University of Minnesota. And WEC is a project by which programs can infuse writing and, and writing instruction at all levels in the undergraduate in, uh, curriculum. This process began in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese Studies in fall 2008. And I see several of the folks that were instrumental in getting that um, initiative off the ground here. After collaborative reflection on challenges and characteristics of writing in the discipline, a writing plan was rat ratified by faculty then in fall of 2009. And then from there, a series of meetings and workshops were organized during the academic year 2009 and 2010. And as part of those meetings, a chart of desired writing abilities was drafted by instructors and faculty together. A baseline assessment of writing abilities of seniors was then carried out in Ju June 2010. A second revised plan was developed and submitted in fall of 2013. This revised plan maintained proposals of the first plan, namely the adoption of a list of core writing abilities in collection and analysis of student writing to track development of writing abilities, while prioritizing and um, pri prioritizing uh, sustainability, making sure that it could continue long term, and oversight, particularly in the upper um, division courses. The writing, uh, the revised plan also requested funding for a research assistant sitting right over here and we'll take over the mic momentarily to oversee the assessment process and work with the director of undergraduate studies to develop rubrics and workshops as well as funding for raters and participant compensation so the writing plan was then implemented in the fall of 2014 so two years ago almost now and then assessment began starting in spring, spring 2015 and is ongoing with the idea that that assessment and implementation is cyclical that we go back and forth between those two. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Anna to start sharing you, sharing with you some more details about that. Okay. So one of the first things, as Mandy said, that happened in this WEC process is the development of a list of discipline-specific discipline writing abilities. And these were developed by our faculty. Um, I'm not going to read the whole list to you, obviously, but here are the criteria that our faculty identified as important for advanced writing in the discipline. Um, and so on the basis of this, um, we gave a survey to faculty at a faculty meeting and asked them to rate what were the three most difficult criteria for students, or what are the three criteria that they're seeing the most student difficulty with in their courses. Um, and the greatest difficulties that we saw were the development of an interpretation of a cultural, literary, or linguistic object of study was the most difficult for students, adopting a critical and analytical rather than personal or expository position, providing concrete examples, and then smoothly integrating textual evidence from sources to support interpretation. The last two were tied, which is why there are four on our list of top three. Um, so yeah, these were what the faculty said they saw students struggling with most in their classrooms. We then compared that, this, this, this project has several different components that we're trying to bring together in this presentation. Um, we compared that to writing production at our 3100 level, which is introduction to literature, introduction to culture, introduction to linguistics. The three, um, after the initial just composition course, these are the three courses that really gear students toward upper level courses in the major. 
Um, and so as my, in my first semester as the RA, what I ended up doing was um, getting six 3100 sections to participate um, and then going and talking to them and getting permission from the students to collect their written work online. What we then did, every student who agreed submitted all of their work online, and then we randomly chose five students from each section and, and downloaded all of their written work for a rating process that happened in the spring. Um, in the spring, then, we took these piles of writing from each, uh, from each course, and all of it was evaluated by two raters working independently. So we had two for 3105, two for 3104, two for 3107. Um, and they rated the work on eight categories of the 12 that we saw, and I'll talk about what eight those were in a bit. They, they rated work on eight categories on a four-point scale from insufficient to more than sufficient, as how is this piece of writing doing at demonstrating this quality? We ended up omitting two categories after the rating, which were identifying sources and inclusion of a bibliography, because not every piece of writing incorporated those, and the raters weren't always consistent in how they handled those that didn't necessarily incorporate them. Sometimes they rated them anyway, and sometimes they just marked it as not applicable. So to kind of get around that, we just discarded those two categories and went with the ones that were applicable across the board. Um, and then on those ratings, I wanted to calculate average scores to kind of see how are we doing at, with these different traits across courses. The problem is, of course, when you have two raters and you're seeing differences, it's hard to tell whether those differences are because people are writing better in one course than another, or whether it's because these two raters are being perhaps more generous than the two raters from a different course. So to kind of get around that, what I did is I calculated z-scores, which is basically how far are these scores from the average score given in this group, right? And that on the plus side allows us to compare across groups to see what are relative strengths and relative weaknesses across courses. On the downside, we do lose any differences that might actually exist between the courses. But for the purposes of comparison, we thought that this would be a good starting point. So I use these z-scores to compare or average across courses. These were the specific writing abilities that we ended up going with for our analysis. The light gray ones are ones we didn't use at all. The two dark gray ones, are, of course, are the ones we used and then ended up discarding. And so we ended up, for this analysis, with six criteria. Um, developing an interpretation, adopting a critical and analytical stance, providing examples, integrating textual evidence, synthesizing critical readings, and identifying and using rhetorical organization appropriate to the discipline. So the results of this weighting showed that, on average, the greatest difficulties that students were having were with adopting a critical and analytical rather than personal or expository position. And this negative 0.52 just shows roughly how far below the average those scores were. So if we take the average of scores on all the characteristics, this was about a half of a standard deviation below the average. Um, that was the lowest we got. The second was identifying and using rhetorical organization appropriate to the discipline. And the third was providing concrete examples. Interestingly, the, um, whoop, maybe, the first two, adopting a critical, or the, the first and the third, a critical and analytical and providing examples, were also ones that the faculty had noted difficulty with. But the greatest strength, according to this rating, was developing an interpretation. Why might we see that difference? Well, we're looking at final drafts in general, whereas faculty are more attuned to the process of writing. So it's possible by the, by the time they get to the final drafts, they have addressed this issue more or less, whereas the faculty are seeing the difficulty in the process is one possible explanation for the discrepancy there. So then we have these criteria that are difficult and we have some agreement, right, at least in that Critical and analytical stands in providing concrete examples are difficult. Faculty see it, our raters are seeing it. Moving to a different part of the project right now, we're looking at um, a syllabus collection. So all instructors in the fall of 2014 were asked to submit the following documents for each course they were teaching. They had to submit a syllabus for the course, one writing assignment prompt and any additional information that went with that, whether that's a rubric, whatever else they gave to their students about that writing assignment, 
and then a form indicating which of the 12 WEC abilities were targeted by that assignment. And so what we're going to do with that information in this analysis, I'm going to present what instructors reported targeting, and we'll compare that to um, my observation looking through the syllabi, looking through the prompts, looking through the rubrics, to see how are these being targeted explicitly in writing in these, um, in these prompts. So this chart, what it shows is what instructors marked as targeting. Each column is a different class. I've taken out the class labels for obvious reasons. Um, but each column is the class, and the dark squares indicate that that instructor said that their assignment targeted that ability. So the last course, which is the senior capstone, I feel comfortable saying that, all of these were targeted in the senior capstone assignment, which makes sense. Along the way, we see a lot of variation with bibliography and identifying appropriate sources being very seldom targeted, therefore kind of making sense that we ended up needing to pull those out of our analysis. Um, we see things like developing an interpretation, critical and analytical stance, and providing concrete examples are the three most emphasized skills, according to instructors, in their prompts. And then the red line there just indicates the intro courses versus the upper level courses. So that you can kind of see how things change when you switch into fully blown, this is the major mode as opposed to the introductory courses. So as I said, the two that were most frequently targeted, critical and analytical, providing concrete examples. Then I sat down and I looked at the syllabi and I coded them in a couple of different ways um, based on how instructors incorporated um, the criteria into their documents. One code was that included direct reference to the criterion, including explanation of key terms or concepts. Um, so for example, and I will give a brief uh, translation more or less of this, um, this was dealing with developing an interpretation. And so it says, the intention of an, a text explanation is to offer an interpretation based on a careful reading of the text from the beginning to the end. That means the explanation should follow in the order of the, text, of the analyzed text and give examples to justify the reading, your interpretation of, the same, uh, of it. It's not just a summary, but it's an explanation of what does it mean. Explain to us how does the text manage to communicate something to the readers. Um, so you, as the author, giving us your reading, remember that you should include examples. Your interpretations have to be based on the text. So we see here a well-developed explanation of what, for this instructor, it means to give an interpretation, including examples, including your opinions, but backed up. Um, and so that was coded as containing direct reference to the criterion, including specific explanation of terms. Another one that was included was inclusion of a series of questions or steps to elicit the desired trait. So maybe the trait wasn't mentioned, but it's clear based on the questions being asked that you're going to get that as a result. So um, one example is this for an annotated bibliography. Um, it doesn't say anywhere in this prompt that your annotations are supposed to be critical and analytical rather than just a, um, it doesn't say that it's supposed to be critical and analytical. It does say, however, that an annotation is not just a summary. And then it says, these are the points, and there were more on the list, that you should include in your annotation, such as, what is the purpose of the author? What is his point of view? Um, what are the assumptions being made? Um, and what methods are used, et cetera? So, questions that will lead to a more critical or analytical approach because it requires students to think about strengths and weaknesses and how things are tied together rather than simply giving a summary. And then the third um, coding I used was a lack of explanation of the characteristic or inclusion of it is only implied. So for example, tw on one of the um, assignment descriptions, 25% of the grade was effective integration of examples from the primary text. And that's all that it says. It doesn't explain what an effective example is. It doesn't explain how to incorporate these examples. It's just, here's a, a bullet point. You're expected to do it. So it's included, but perhaps not as developed in terms of explanation as it could be. Uh, and then the fourth was the characteristic is just not included, as far as I could tell. So this chart shows what I saw in the prompts and the syllabi and the rubrics. The green 
um, is, again, where it was fully explained, well developed. The blue is there was a series of questions or steps to elicit the characteristic, and the yellow is lack of explanation, characteristic only implied, white, I saw nothing. Okay. So you can kind of see there's a lot of yellow going on here, not as much green, kind of an intermediate amount of blue. Now, I thought, okay, this is great, but the most interesting thing is to see what is happening when faculty think that they're targeting this assignment, what am I actually seeing? So this one shows my ratings only for the cases where faculty indicated that they, faculty or instructors indicated that they were targeting this concept, and the red is they said that it was targeted, but I didn't find any inclusion in any of the written materials. No mention, no hint, no steps, nothing. And so again, we do have a fair bit of green, some yellow, some blue, but the amount of red there kind of struck out to, uh, stuck out to me as important. Um, how did this relate to those top two difficulties? Critical and analytical stance, a lot of yellow there. A lot of yellow, a lot of, we say we want it, but it's not explained. For providing concrete examples, at the lower levels, sometimes that's well explained what it means. At the upper levels, if it's mentioned, which it's not frequently, you know, it, it's, it's just not a strong presence. So one of the things that this kind of st made stand out to me was that if we're thinking students are having a problem, perhaps part of the issue is that we're not communicating to them what we're looking for in a way that they are taking up as we would expect them to. Now, this is not to say that the only reason students are struggling is this, right? Because the strongest result, which was synthesizing, um, exist, uh, synthesizing cr existing critical readings, was only reported as targeted in about half of the assignments, and it was only well-defined in a few of them. But perhaps with these that we do see students struggling with, perhaps shoring up rubrics and descriptions can help students get there. Um, so some general takeaways from this point. Even though faculty might have a good idea of what they're wanting to convey in student writing, even though they intuitively know it when they see it, the students might not get that message. They might not intuitively understand what the faculty are trying to communicate. Um, how this relates to previous work, a Leckie 2007 cited common criteria problems guidelines for writing can be and often are underspecified, which leaves students unclear about how to proceed except for superficial injunctions such as page numbers, number of references. If expectations are tacit, they can't be taught explicitly. So we're seeing this, and this also uh, Pamela Flash here at the university leads an entire workshop on how to develop effective grading criteria and rubrics because this is such a common thing. Um, another way to relate this to previous work, Ruiz Funes, 2001, talks about task representation, which is how students understand tasks set for them. And in this um, study, they, had, they gave students um, an assignment requiring them to interpret, and they found that many students just did a summary. Several did a summary with a comment, but it was still predominantly a summary. And some, but not as many, did an interpretation like they were asked to do. And so the idea is the same exact assignment can be interpreted in very different ways by students, right? And so students need to be taught how to interact with the text, elaborate on it, transform its information in order to create insightful papers. They need to be taught what it is that we're looking for and how to give it to us. Um, and then Crowhurst 1980 talked about cognitive demand, which is that some of these tasks that are more difficult, um, such as giving an argument or an interpretation, are more cognitively demanding in the location of relevant content, for example, and in the organization and logical use of the content than descriptive or narrative writing. So expecting them to just be able to do it is not necessarily going to give the effect, or give the, the, um, get the results that we're looking for. And I think at this point, Pass this back over to Mandy. This way. All right, so one of the weaknesses or shortcomings that we saw in the students' writing was that ability to take a critical and analytical stance. And we saw then, too, that faculty sometimes explicitly address that and sometimes they don't. But this is a feature that is common to academic writing and Schleppigrell in this um, statement here about academic texts, we can see this highlighted. 
um, she writes that academic texts make meaning in ways that are informationally dense and authoritatively presented. At the same time, these texts embed ideologies and position readers in ways that can seem natural and unchallenging, or unchallengeable, excuse me. Um, and so in this way, the, the author positions the reader as somebody to be informed. Right, somebody that we're, that we're sharing information with. And so what we're going to do in the second half of this presentation is we're going to look at how students create or don't create a critical and analytical stance as this was found to be a weakness. And we'll examine this through four analyses. The first is um, their lexical choice, particularly their use of hedges. Second, we're going to look at interpersonal metaphors of modality that they use. Third, we're going to look at the sources that they use for their evidence and then also how they present their evidence, so the forms that they use to do that. And we'll deal with each of these analyses separately, introducing it and presenting it um, and presenting the results immediately after that. Um, but I need to just set up real quickly where the data are coming from. So. Um, we have, as if you remember back to the big WEC project, we do hope to, to track students longitudinally to understand how they're developing their writing skills as part of the major. Well, in our major, 3015, Spanish 3015, is the first course that they take as part of that major. Um, and it serves as a transition course from the language-focused classes to the upper division or content-focused classes. As such, it focuses on moving students from that personal and practical communication that is emphasized in the lower division courses. Um, to more academic language skills, which is typical of those more advanced levels of proficiency and is required for lit literary, linguistic, and cultural studies, which is what our majors engage in. Um, writing in this course is relative, uh, writing instruction is relatively uniform in the sense that the same genres of writing are targeted across all of the sections that we teach. Um, and also in the, the grammatical structures that are targeted as well. So in that sense, it's uniform. However, each instructor can choose the topic for the different compositions and that they can also choose then how the instruction happens. Um, so that's the participants that we have participating in this study, the students. This sample that we're gonna analyze today is coming from the very beginning. So we're starting at the beginning here. Um, and what they did, we, in addition to collecting the writing that they did as part of the class, we also had them do a baseline sample so that we could see what they could do spontaneously. And so this data that we're presenting today is coming from that baseline sample. And at that time, they were provided this prompt, which is translated here for you. It was given to them in Spanish. And I know many of you, there's been a lot of work happening around the Hungry Planet series. Um, but so they were provided this prompt and they were asked to analyze um, the products and habits and social relationships that they see in this photo um, and relating them to personal experience and general knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so in our analysis that we're going to look at, we're gonna, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to first look at the claims that they make, um, their use of hedges and their metaphors of modality, and then also looking at the evidence that they pro provide. All right, so with, we're gonna start with the hedges or qualifiers. Um, Zwires in 2008 identifies the use of qualifiers or hedges as a feature of academic writing. Hedges or qualifiers allow an author to show an awareness of his or her own limited knowledge and views about a topic, exceptions to his or her claims, and other perspectives, and in this way can be used to lessen the force or universality of a claim. Myers in 1989 also notes that they might serve as a negative politeness strategy as a means of recognizing and respecting the expertise and possible differences of opinion that could be out there. But by doing that, there is the possibility that this can weaken your authoritative stance as an author. Um, so what do we see in these um, 11 students that we have um, when they're making claims. Of the 11 students, 10 of them used hedges when stating a claim. So a pretty high percentage. And when we look at the number of hedges that they're producing, um, it ranges. We have some students, we have the one student who doesn't produce any, and we have a few that have one, and we have some that go as high as five. 
in a relatively short text, um, a short paragraph. Yeah, they only had 10 minutes, I think I forgot to mention that, to write, so it's not a real lengthy paragraph. But we do see that when they use the hedges, uh, it's actually extensive <laughs> use of hedges when they're commenting on the family or the Mexican culture. Right, so the minute that they're asked to make that interpretation is when that hedge comes out. And we can see a couple examples here. Um, I have them up on the screen in the original Spanish, and I have not corrected for the language the students um, produced. Um, so any vocabulary, grammatical issues are the students' own. Um, but so in that first one, we can see our, our meaning American, um, value on food and materialism possibly is different than those of a Mexican family. Instead of having value on the self, a Mexican generally puts emphasis on the family. But we see that possibly and generally. We also see in that second example, it's possible that this family also thinks that it's important to avoid store-bought products. And this could be uh, an important value. And then the amount of fresh food suggests that the family cooks more. And it's possible that cooking is a cost, uh, uh, tradition. tradition, custom, thank you. <laughs> um, so we see that coming out a lot anytime they're talking about the Mexican culture. Um, but we again see that it's primarily used to allow for probability and possibility. And I've got a couple of quotes up here. Um, you, we, you can, even if you don't know Spanish, you can see the highlighted words are probably um, there. Um, we also see the word to be able, so that the, the verb poder um, used a lot to weaken um, a conclusion or an inference. And um, so the fruits and vegetables could be grown for, by local families. Um, and I, I guess it's not highlighted in here, but um, could show, this, I, and I forget exactly what they were talking about, could show the influence of the more powerful um, countries on Mexicans as a result of the production and distribution across the world. So anytime they're trying to make an assertion, we see this poder um, come out in their, in their writing. All right, so that was the first um, analysis that we did. The second one that we're gonna look at are interpersonal metaphors of modality. Um, so as we said, that critical analytical stance often also gets connected to this authoritative stance that writers take in academic writing. Um, and so the relationship between author and reader is encapsulated within the resource of tenor. And this is coming from the, the framework of systemic functional linguistics of Halliday. Um, and so this contextual variable of tenor creates the interpersonal meaning of texts, which can position the writer with respect to the meaning of the text or establish the relationship between the reader and the writer. Writers can create and manipulate interpersonal meanings through a variety of linguistic resources, among which are modal metaphors. Um, we, there are four different layers to modal metaphors today. Um, we're gonna focus on orientation. So we're just going to focus on the, their use of subjective um, or objective and then explicit implicit. And I'm going to explain those to you here. So the objective subjective dimension distinguishes between propositions which clearly identify themselves with the author and those in which modality is expressed without reference to the author. So the explicit objective dimension, on the other hand, indicates the location of the modality in relation to the proposition. Explicit metaphors of modality are expressed in proje a projecting clause about the proposition, whereas the proposition and modality are expressed in the same clause in implicit metaphors of modality. So I've got a couple examples here. So these combine. So in an explicit objective metaphor, We've got the um, modality expressed in a projecting clause because the proposition is that Mary knows. So we have this other explicit clause, it's likely that Mary knows. And it's objective because it's not tied directly to the author saying this is how I see it. So and then in an explicit subjective, we see the presence of the author come out. I think Mary knows. 
we then have implicit objective where we all of a sudden we don't have that additional clause. The proposition and modality are expressed together. Mary probably knows and implicit subjective, Mary will know. All right. Um, so those are the four categories that we can have. Again, we have 10 of the 11 participants produce metaphors of modality, and of those 10, seven produce them between one and three with the claims that they make. We're only looking at them in the claims. They do also appear in the evidence, which is interesting <laughs> as well. Um, we have three uh, students, however, that produce five or six of them. And in a 10 minute writing, to have five or six of these in a short paragraph, it's pretty striking. It's pretty much every claim they're making. Um, and so there were total 28 interpersonal metaphors and modality in total. Um, of those, the most common was the explicit subjective. So, um, and I've got some um, examples here. I would think that the majority of food is more fresh. So we've got that I would think. Or I believe that in Latin America, the uh, extended family is very important. Or I imagine that um, the family, they live in a city where the supermarket, supermarket sells products like cornflakes and Coke. Um, so that was the most common. It was 11 of the 28 that we saw. Um, we then see that the explicit objective and implicit objective are equally common, with eight of those being produced across the samples. Um, so we have the explicit objective on the left-hand side. We have, it's clear that this family is a, fa a modern family. And then the subject here was coming from a previous statement, but so avoiding uh, store-bought products could be uh, an important um, value. And so there was only then one token of the implicit subjective, and it, it came with the verb deber, which is should, um, so, but it's also combined with the explicit subjective. <laughs> but, so they're really emphasizing um, the metaphors of modality here. I think that the, pod, the, the, pod, the mother and father could or should be from a, a good, have a good job or a position of, of power because they can then support their family. But that use of the should is that modal. What we see here is we see a lot of overlap with the hedges. Um, and at times, the hedges and metaphors and modality are actually in opposition. So we have this explicit subjective in this statement. Yo sé que, which is I know that Mexico has the, the biggest or heaviest population, obesity of the world. And then they put or almost all the world, right? So they're hedging it, kind of like, I know this, well, maybe not as much. So we see, we see this contradiction, this need to, to um, hedge. Um, all right, so that was kind of how they do their claims, moving into the use of evidence. Um, we've seen earlier in the presentation this need to um, bring in evidence to justify the claims that are made, and that, again, makes it logical and less personal. Um, however, Hinkle in 2002 reports that second language um, users have been shown to use more personal stories as, um, for arguments as opposed to outside evidence. Um, and Rose in 1989 says that second language writers and students are aware of the need to integrate examples or evidence, they just don't know how to do so. And then finally, um, Shaughnessy in 1977 also saying that moving between the abstract, which are the interpretations, the claims, and the concrete, which is the evidence, requires linguistic resources that allow for generalizing information, which really is saying kind of the same thing as Rose, that they don't know how to do it. Um, but what are we seeing in this writing sample? So the types of evidence, um, they, in the writing that we have from them, they use five different sources of evidence. The most common was the photo. And you know, if you think about the prompt, that makes good sense. We had 38 references or 38 of the examples of evidence coming from there. So the majority of the food in this room is fresh food, but we also see um, food that looks North American like cornflakes. Um, we also have them um, drawing on general or shared information or knowledge, such as Mexico is a large area and it's hot all year. Um, 
and that there are many families without money to buy sufficient food. We have some that pull in personal experiences. Um, and so they were, they were struck by the number of liters of Coke that were in the image. And so when I went to Mexico six years ago, the first day my family, in quotes, host family, um, went to a restaurant and ordered Fanta for everyone. So that was their, yes, this is a, you know, a common thing because I also have experience with this. Um, and sometimes they use previous claims as evidence for the next comment, which is not uncommon in academic writing. Um, so um, you see this comment that they're probably used to make um, traditional foods, and so that's kind of their claim. And then this shows the importance of fresh food to them. And then one refers to an outside report. Recently, Mexico was reported as the, the country with the um, most obese people in the world. So there must have been a report that, because we had a couple people <laughs> reference this or something, maybe they even read in class. Um, it is important to note that not, not all claims have evidence to support them. So there were some claims made with no evidence. And at times, they actually include evidence, but don't do it anything with it. So they don't use it to make any point or make any claims. So then how do they go about presenting this evidence in their writing? Um, when the evidence is based on the photo, the verb haber or I, um, so that's the there is, there are, is the most common form used to present evidence. Um, and so then we end up with lists, right? There's this, 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 and this. Um, and I'm not going to read through all of that there. Um, just like I said, sometimes it's used with a list. Other times we get lists used in isolation without even any verb. Um, we have a lot of declarative statements. Um, and so I, basically anything that didn't include the verb haber but was, it was declarative was put in this statement. Um, so we see many of the, the products are fruits and vegetables that represent the importance of fresh foods or fresh products. We also had, interestingly, narratives come out. So rather than you know saying there is, there are, we had students saying things such as, I see the fruits and vegetables first, and then all of the, the, the sodas at the back of, or behind the, the children. So they're kind of presenting like this, their process of interpreting it. Um, and then we also had some narratives that were used as their evidence as well. Um, and here's another one. I don't see any uh, grandparents or other old family members, um, was that statement. We do have one case. This was the only case of an anomalization. So rather than referring and listing everything that's in the image, they just said like the amount of fresh food, and then they made a statement. And this would be considered anomalization, which is something that's much more sophisticated and requires a higher level of cognitive um, investment. All right, so our discussion. So we see. Um, here that the participants are using a variety of linguistic res resources. Um, and so the various factors can account for, I would almost say, the overuse of hedges and explicit subjective metaphors of modality. Among them, first, their intermediate level of language proficiency and their previous and current language learning experiences, a task effect and cognitive vulnerability. At the intermediate level of proficiency, learners primarily focus on concrete topics of personal reference or relevance. As such, the majority of their experiences have centered on them. Talking about their activities, preferences, and experiences. Anecdotally, when I visit and um, observe language classrooms um, that move students to topics of broader general interest, I've observed students pulling the topic back to the personal and unable to talk about the topic because of a lack of knowledge or a text on which to base their experience or their conversation. So this tendency may likely be an effect of the interaction between proficiency and their instructional experiences. Um, use of hedges and metaphors of modality may similarly be the result of the task, which asks them to develop an interpretation with only one piece of evidence. Um, students may have recognized their limited expertise and wished to highlight this in the case that their claims were incorrect. 
We've looked qu quickly in kind of in a non-systematic way at the writing these same students have done that's gone through process, and we don't see as many hedges in their process writing when they have time to plan and organize it. Um, that, but that is actually the expansion that's going to happen for AAAL um, next month. And so as for how to move students beyond this level, results indicate a need to provide students with the necessary information from which to make claims. So they need something to start from. They can't just start from nothing and make an interpretation as well as focused attention on developing other types of metaphors of modality, so not everything needs to be explicit. Specifically, implicit, subjective, and objective, because those would be the way in which you can include your, your stance, but do so in a, what was the word, the embedded way, so that it's um, not challengeable, potentially. Um, okay. Oh, and you, do you want to talk about cognitive model? Okay. Uh, um, Anna can, yeah, maybe mention cognitive vulnerability because we're running short on time here. Um, by and large, the participants of this study provided evidence for their claims based on the images in the given photo. In many cases, this happened via the lexical item I. Godfrey, Tracy, and Tyrone in 2014 that gr noted also greater use of Ilia, and excuse me, my French is not very good. Um, uh, in the French second language writing um, corresponded with description in lists as opposed to analysis, which is what we're seeing here as well. Um, in most cases, the evidence is presented in the ream of a sentence or in the comment part of a sentence rather than the theme about which a comment can be made. There are examples to the contrary, but by and large, I is associated with less analytical commentary as was seen in the Godfrey et al. study. Work with more advanced language learners in other languages has suggested that other linguistic resources, such as grammatical metaphor and complex themes, are markers of advanced language capacities. Structures such as these would allow learners to reduce use of I and place greater focus on the analysis of content rather than what the content is. So Achugar and Colombi in 2009 note that learners lack experience in the use of language in an academic context and have to expand their meaning-making resources to incorporate ways of using language in more specialized and in abstract forms. And again, although this could be a result of the task, um, because students had only 10 minutes to write, they didn't have a lot of organization time. I, um, we see some similarity with the Godfrey et al. study and that they had 50 minutes and they were still <laughs> overusing I um, and had similar findings. So finally, we're to the conclusion stage. Okay, so just kind of to recap, basically everything that we've seen up until this point we saw at the beginning faculty and instructors might intuitively know what constitutes good writing, but students need more explicit guidance. Second, students do have general strategies for making claims and presenting evidence, which uh, Mandy talked about, but these strategies are not the most effective in producing advanced critical and analytical discourse. They're trying, they, they, they know at least on some level that they have to do it, but they don't know how. And so from here, what do we do? Effective teaching might involve not only explaining expectations and defining criteria more clearly, but also helping students move away from subjective and explicit expressions of modality and identifying more complex ways of presenting evidence, such as grammatical metaphors, such as nominalization, rather than simply I. Uh, where do we want to go with this in the future? We have a wealth of data from this WEC project that we're, we're trying to figure out how to um, corral and make behave for us. One of the things we want to look at is other genres of writing, things that they did have more time to plan out. Um, look at discourse structure and organization. That was another one of the difficulties that students were having. How are they organizing um, their, um, their writing? And then we have a longitudinal study underway right now where not only are we gathering all of their writing throughout the major, but we're also doing this um, pre-writing with the, with the photo prompt. They're going to do that again at the end of the major as well. So we can have a basis of comparison that is the same task in two different points in their development. So we'll be able to compare those and see what, did they, what, what gains did they make. Um, and then we do want to consider some of those other forms, grammatical metaphor, relative clauses, nominalizations, to see how those develop throughout their time in the program. And that's what we got.
and I know we're short on time, but we hope we can have a couple extra minutes because we really do want to have a conversation about this. Yeah, we're we're good. Yeah, we're so. good. <laughs> um, when they were writing, were they allowed to um, access? Right, and in this case, they weren't, and they only had 10 minutes to, to, to follow the prompt. So it was sit down and what can you do under pressure in a very short amount of time. So there were no additional resources. One of the other things is, and this is you know where we're headed next, is we're going to look at the process writing when they've had that time to pull on the other resources are we seeing as much hedging I would hope that we're not right because they have something on which to base those claims a little bit more solidly the evidence that's available to them but we'll we'll see what we find <laughs> so Elaine and then we'll go over to Shonda um, I, I know I saw you writing down all sorts of things so good one, one thing I'd like to bring up now is um, Trying to sort out whether they know how to construct an argument and construct discourse in general versus whether they know the Spanish linguistic expressions to do what they know how to do in English. So I wondered if it would be interesting, if you thought of this or possible, to have them do the same task in English to see how do they structure that, assuming and it's an assumption that they have the linguistic expressions they need to, to nominalize, for example, to talk about immigration and poverty and have expressions like that. They have them in English, but do they have them in Spanish? And that leads to the second issue that might be good to talk about, Bert and certainly at AAAL. But um, Barnes, Bronner and Barnes Carroll offered students doing tasks like this sentence frames. And they explicitly taught them sentence frames that contain nominalizations and expressions that they could they could use to scaffold their so they knew this linguistic expression is right and this is the function and then they would use those. So that usage based approach to language acquisition is something that people at Georgetown talked about a lot and would be good to sort of mention that in your presentation. Yeah, and I think there's this assumption, right, that this is just a matter of doing this in the second language, and I think that is probably a wrong assumption. I think if we talk to our colleagues in other departments across campus, they would um, not only identify many of the same traits that came out from the faculty in our writing project, but also some of the same struggles that students may have a hard time creating that stance and integrating that evidence in a meaningful way. Um, so I, I think your idea about having the, see what, what they can do in the first language is important. And so that maybe we can try and sneak that into the final. That's the first thing. But the second one was the instructional things. Yeah. Offering the instructors the idea of, here are some linguistic sentence frames you can teach your students to use. When I think even with our instructors, it's one of those things, you know, when you say, I want this, you recognize it. Mm -hmm. But to tell students and guide them through how to do that is a different task. Being able to describe what a critical analytical, analytical stance is, being able to describe and help them form an interpretation and use that language is different. So if we can help them see what that involves and what language that involves, they can then give students those skills. Don't say this. Say, yeah. This. And here's another sentence frame. Well, and I think letting them see that in the readings that they're doing too, right? Because as our, our PACE results, as we look at our major, our students are doing great in reading, mm -hmm. right? So they're getting lots of exposure to reading and, and processing arguments, but then what, so how is the author letting them analyze it for language? What kinds of language are they using there, too? Right, right. So, yep. Shauna? Um, that was pretty related to what I was going to say. <laughs> I was just wondering if, if um, things like the nominalization, grammatical metaphor, relative clauses that you mentioned are actually being taught in the classes now. I'll say I've never taught it. And I've taught from the language level up through 3107. So 
Um, if my experience is anything like anyone else's, no, because I didn't know that this was something to be teaching. I didn't know that this was a thing until we started looking at it. So definitely, as far as my experience shows, it's not being taught. So Meryl Swain, and I could give you this source too that you could cite, she talks about the fact that input, uh, reading, uh, you just have to process it for meaning. In order to produce, to write, then you have to process the linguistic forms. So having an approach to reading, if you had an activity where you had them go back and identify the linguistic forms used by the author for particular functions, make a list, and have them create their own sentence frames, might be a nice way of bridging into the writing. That's where I want to go with that multi-literacies project I'm talking to you about later in the week. <laughs> All right, I think I see, was it Gabriella? And did it, Milsey, did you have your hand up too? Well, why don't we go to you first, and then since Gabriella's already asked one. So what it's been like, because this was a 3015 sample. Uh -huh. And in 3015 at the beginning, it's a uh, ser, estar, uh, agreement, and then we move later on to the nominal clauses and all those adjectival adverbs. So there are things that are taught, and I was wondering, the picture is very concrete, you know, and there is no topic about description of food in 3015. Um, but if you are planning to use, do you say the same picture at the end in the same class, 3015? No, with this, with graduating majors. Okay. So it'll be the same participants, but however many semesters or years later. Because I was thinking probably a different kind of picture would allow them to. It might, but I think that's where the task comes in, right? And given that they're an intermediate level learner, it needs, to, we don't want the vocabulary necessarily to be, to get in their way. We want them to have easy access and retrieval for the, that vocabulary. And I think by asking them to then take what they see here and interpret it, I think it raises the bar a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, task instructions, I agree, are very important. So the broader Barnes Carroll, the instructions are, Talk, using this picture, talk to me about concepts we studied in class, mm -hmm. right? So they've read things on immigration and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And so they, they, that, those they instructions that. tell the learners they're supposed to frame it theoretically using these concepts, right? Mm -hmm. So they're there. Yeah. Well, and that's really what I think came out of, you know, the first part of the analysis from what Anna's work is, that we really need to structure things in be explicit about, explicit about what we're expecting yeah. of learners. Mm -hmm. I just want to comment on that first piece, because I would caution you know, that that comes only from written documents and writing instruction. It also occurs in the classes, you know, as there are students preparing these papers, you know, there's a likely, and I don't know in classes, a lot of discussion about what that is. And then, you know, the other part of the instruction is in the process, right? Because you know, right. Right? Is well, the feedback that students receive on those early tasks. Right, well, so, definitely. Yeah. So definitely. I'm just a caution to say this is from the, all you know, the written materials, but it's not all of the writing instruction. Right, well, and, and that's one of the things that we're looking at in the longitudinal WEC project as well. We've asked students for each class that they take, talk to us about what is done in class as far as preparing you for writing, as far as preparing you to write your papers. How often is this talked about in class? What kinds of instructions are you given? So they not only update their prompts, but we also ask them in the longitudinal study to summarize the verbal instructions that were given to them to see what is it that they are understanding. So yeah, this, this analysis is limited to what we have in the documents. Um, and based, I guess, off of the idea of what Pamela Flash talks about in her workshops, that the documents are, when students are at home writing, the documents are what they are what they have available to them, so that's where we started with it. But there's definitely more to look at. But their notes. I mean, you can collect their notes too, right? As far as notes in class, class yeah. in mm -hmm. terms of you know what they've written down, because they'll refer to those too. Right. Mm -hmm. I had a question. That, so um, the 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 focus on writing in the Spanish program is on academic writing. Mm -hmm. That's that's what this project is all about. Is there any um, does the whole program focus on academic writing from the beginning through the end, or is it just starting in thirty fifteen? I think we do have. So asking about the language program, like the lower division courses. 
it transitions to that. I feel like in the second year, there's a little bit more of a focus on um, taking it beyond the personal, so dealing at least with the topics of broader general interest, but I don't know that there's a focus on like any specific discipline. Um, and I don't think my instructors would say that it's academic, right? I think it's kind of a, an inter, intermediate step. So, and I, you know, as, as I think about it, I think that's part of what we need though, right? We need to start transitioning earlier and not even, I would say, get rid of the word transitioning. We need to just have an integrated approach so that we're dealing with that earlier and from the beginning. You've got a great, got a great deal here. You've identified what your goal is. Mm -hmm. and, and if that start, the earlier that can start, it seems to me the better. So that it's not something when they get to 3015, this is a new experience for them. Yeah, agreed. It was interesting how many of them used the word el poder, power. Like they were wanting to talk about big ideas, right? Mm -hmm. It seems. I think, you know, it's actually interesting. There were one or two of them that were really fun to read because you could see them wrestling with their preconceived notions and how this picture fit or didn't fit. Um, but again, it's in 10 minutes. They, they're just starting to scratch the surface and they didn't have the time. Like it was, this is where I really felt like it was the writing to process, right? The writing to learn. They were learning through the process of writing. And so by the end, they're starting to figure out their idea. And so from there, then they would have had a really cool interpretation and analysis. <laughs> and I, I would say that also, you know, in, in the intermediate level, when they write their informal pieces and description and stuff, with the feedback, I was trying to say, you know, trying to get away from the suits. So I think. The stereotypes, so I think, like adding those things, I think they are building on those skills to not just say todos los mexicanos or something. <laughs> so that's the thing. And all these uh, classes have the writing intensive courses that participate. So there is processing. I'm going to stop the discussion. I apologize for letting it run longer. It was too interesting. <laughs> so thank you for your Thank you, guys.